Well, again, this morning we're returning to the Beatitudes in the Sermon on the Mount. And what I'd like to do is begin by reading them, um, and I'll probably read them all each time. I know from my own experience, <clears throat> and I'm sure you experience this as well, that even if we spend a half an hour saturating ourselves with a particular idea, uh, we tend to forget it as soon as the sermon's over, and sometimes I find myself, the one who did all the preparation and did all, the, all this preaching, I find myself forgetting what I was even preaching on the week before. So if I'm having that difficulty and I realize that you know, it's not unique to me, I realize we must all be having this difficulty, but these are things that we don't want to forget. These are things that we need to put on. And if, if we hear, as James reminds us, if, if we look into the, the, the law of liberty, the perfect law, and, and we see ourselves, but then we, we walk away and forget what we've seen, then we're not going to benefit at all from that. We're a forgetful hearer. James tells us we need to be effectual doers. And until this becomes incorporated into our lives, it really hasn't benefited us at all. So I want to try to keep these things in front of us. And as I said before, I am going to review the first four that we've seen, but when you hear the review, don't, don't just sort of kick into neutral saying, okay, okay, we heard this until we get down to the new stuff. Uh, this is something that we need to, again, think about and be challenged by and, again, be encouraged uh, to do. So let's begin by, uh, by reading them in um, Matthew chapter 5, verses 1 through 12. When Jesus saw the crowds, he went up on the mountain. And after he sat down, his disciples came to him. He opened his mouth and began to teach them, saying, Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. Blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Blessed are the peacemakers, for they shall be called sons of God. Blessed are those who have been persecuted for the sake of righteousness, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Blessed are you when people insult you and persecute you, and falsely say all kinds of evil against you because of me. Rejoice and be glad, for your reward in heaven is great. For in the same way they persecuted the prophets who were before you. Now this morning we're going to be looking at verse 7. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Well, as I've, I've already mentioned, uh, we are returning to the Beatitudes, and, and we have seen up to this point that the Beatitudes are really describing for us the Lord Jesus Christ, what he is really like, what is really in his heart. And I, I want to emphasize really because a lot of people have a, you know, a lot of different views of what Jesus is like. And some of them are perhaps uh, uh, too loving and gracious so that sin doesn't matter to him at all. And others are, are so stern and harsh that that's all that they see. Jesus just looks at sin and condemns it. But we need to see that this is what Jesus is like. We need to get a view, a proper view of him from Scripture. So these describe Jesus. And since they do, they also describe what his spirit is doing in us, since it's his work to make us like him. So what is Jesus like according to these Beatitudes? Well, first of all, Jesus is the one who humbled himself. Remember, he is poor in spirit, at least in his state of humiliation. What that means is that the Son of God who was rich, the eternal Son of God who had forever in eternity absolutely everything he needed in himself to be perfectly blessed and happy and satisfied, being in this state, yet he became poor. He descended from heaven. He didn't give up his deity, still God, but he took to himself our humanity 
and was born into a poor family and took very little, had very little of the world's goods throughout his life so that he might do what was necessary to save us and to make us rich. We possess the riches of his kingdom through what he has done. Jesus emptied himself to become the servant of all or as he says in scripture, the least of all. He became the one who was willing to serve us even to the point of death. He took the curse that was meant for us upon himself when he was on the cross and he died in our place in order that he might save us. And for that descent, for that humbling, for that emptying to become the least in the kingdom, he became the greatest of all. He gained the kingdom. Now again, the Spirit is working that same grace within us. Jesus says, blessed are the poor in spirit. Blessed are those, happy are those who are humbling themselves like Jesus humbled himself in order to serve him, in order to serve each other, and in order to serve the lost by bringing the gospel to them. Blessed are the poor in spirit, for theirs is the kingdom of heaven. Jesus is the one who mourns for sin and its consequences. Now, in the case of Jesus, not his sin, because Jesus is absolutely perfect, but he did grieve and mourn over the sins of those around him, over our sins, over our hardness of heart. He was the one who was moved with compassion to help us, and he did, as we've just seen. And Jesus was comforted. Blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. As a result of his work, of his sufferings, he sees those whom the Father gives to him. He sees how his work, what he has done, will reverse the effects of sin on all of creation. And he is satisfied. He is comforted. Now again, the Spirit of God does the same thing in us. He makes us mourn for our sins. He changes us by giving us his Holy Spirit who gives us love, love for what is good, love for what is right, that makes us mourn over sin, over evil, our own sin, so that we turn away from it to Jesus. And the sins of others, especially the consequences they're going to have to face for their sins if they do not turn away from those sins and turn to Jesus Christ. And that makes us reach out to them, even as Jesus did. And we also receive comfort from our grieving because we know having turned to Jesus, our sins are forgiven. And we also know the Lord is going to use our efforts to reach out to others that they also might be forgiven. So blessed are those who mourn, for they shall be comforted. Jesus also, as we saw, was meek. He was gentle. That doesn't mean that he was weak, but what it means is his love was strong. He was kind and considerate. He was never harsh, never intimidating but always welcoming and easy to approach. And I think we understand that. That's the reason why we came to him. We didn't come to one whom we thought would terrorize us, reject us, cast us away, but rather one who would receive us according to his promise that the one who comes to him, he would certainly not cast out. It was in this lamb-like meekness that our Lord Jesus Christ went to the cross to give his life and for this sacrifice he receives the new heavens and the new earth. Remember, he says, blessed are the gentle, for they shall inherit the earth. The new heavens and new earth is the eternal kingdom of God. That's what Jesus is inheriting. And that's what we will inherit as well if we have this virtue in us, which the Spirit of God is working in us. Remember, he fills us with the love of Christ. He makes us also welcoming and easy to approach so that others will also listen to us as we reach out to them as ambassadors of Jesus and find salvation in him. And so that we'll also better be able to reach out to others, uh, to one another, and to help one another become more like him. Now finally we saw that Jesus hungers and thirsts for righteousness, for what is right, for what is good, I think if there's anyone who had this perfect hunger and thirst, it had, it's, it's Jesus. He's the only one who did. His greatest and only desire on earth was to please his Father and to do what his Father called him to do, 
to accomplish his will. This was far more important to Jesus than anything he could have possibly gained in the world. We don't see Jesus moving up in the business world. We don't see him as becoming, as it were, the, the biggest celebrity, although he did become a celebrity, but it wasn't the kind that we think of today. He wasn't trying to be a sports figure, but rather he was not trying to gain anything from this world. He was coming to serve, to do the will of his Father. That was his hunger. That was his thirst. That was his heart's desire. And that was more important to him than even his necessary food. Ministering to the woman at the well satisfied him rather than the food that the disciples were bringing to him. We also noted that this was the secret to how Jesus was able to do as much as he did in in so little time, those three and a half years of his ministry, was because his heart was dedicated to God. And it still, still is. And Jesus, of course, is satisfied. He says, blessed are those who hunger and thirst for righteousness, for they shall be satisfied. He now sits in heaven in the satisfaction that he has done what is honoring to his Father and continues to do what is honoring to his Father. He sits in heaven in the company of those who are perfectly righteous, the Father, the Spirit, and the angels, and, of course, his holy people. And, of course, what he desired uh, to do, he has accomplished, and he sees the people that he has changed through his work, and that satisfies him as well. And, of course, the Lord Jesus Christ has also changed us so that we now find our satisfaction in being and doing what pleases the Father. As a matter of fact, we're going to see more about that this evening, actually this morning as well. All of these things please the Father. But blessed are the pure in heart, for they shall see God. Now, Jesus says we are blessed if these qualities are in us. This humility, this grieving over sin, this gentleness, this hungering and thirsting for what is good and what is right, because these things show that we belong to Jesus, that his image is being formed in us by his Holy Spirit. And we are blessed because if we belong to Jesus, we are also the heirs, his heirs. We are going to receive what Jesus actually earned, his kingdom, his comfort, the new heavens and the new earth, and the desire that we have in our hearts for what is right and good, that hungering and thirsting will one day be satisfied. We desire to be like Jesus. One day we will be like Jesus. We desire that things be the way Jesus wants them to be. One day we'll be in a place where they will actually be that way when we're in heaven and when we're in the new heavens and the new earth. And of course, we also were reminded the stronger we become in each of these areas, the more we know that these blessings belong to us because the more or more clearly we're going to see that we believe we belong to Jesus. Now this morning, let's consider the next uh, beatitude. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And again, let's expect to be challenged in this area, as in all the other areas, because showing mercy is not an easy thing. Now we've already been reminded the beatitudes are describing to us Jesus. All these things are true of him. And I think when we think of Jesus, we usually think of him in that ultimate act of service when he lays down his life on the cross, when he shows us this great mercy in giving his life for us. So I think this, perhaps above all the other qualities, is is the one we usually think of, at least if we're thinking about Jesus in the way that we should, because he is full of of mercy. Now that shouldn't surprise us because Jesus is just like his father. Remember the author to the Hebrews says in Hebrews 1 verse 3, and he that is Jesus is the radiance of his glory and the exact representation of his nature. Jesus said to Philip because of that in John 14:9 when Philip says show us the father Jesus and it's enough for us. Jesus says to him, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Have I been with you so long, Philip, and you still haven't come to know me? He who has seen me has seen the Father. Now, he's not saying that he is the Father, 
But what he is reflecting is, is what we read in Hebrews chapter 1, verse 3. He is the exact representation of God's nature because he is the Son of God in our nature. So to see him is to see the Father. Well, what is the Father like? Well, the Father, in, in, at least for our purposes this morning, is merciful. Jesus actually pointed to the Father as the example to us of how we should show mercy to others. Let me read from Luke 6, verses 31 through 36. Jesus says, Treat others the same way you want them to treat you. If you love those who love you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners love those who love them. If you do good to those who do good to you, what credit is that to you? For even sinners do the same. If you lend to those from whom you expect to receive, what credit is that to you? Even sinners lend to sinners in order to receive back the same amount. Now here's the contrast. But love your enemies, not those who love you, not those who do good to you, not those who are lending to you, but those who don't love you, those who aren't good to you, those who are stealing from you. Love your enemies and do good, and lend expecting nothing in return, and your reward will be great, and you will be sons of the Most High, for He Himself is kind to ungrateful and evil men. Be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. Is that easy to do? <laughs> no, that's not easy to do, but is it possible to do it? Yes, it is, because the Spirit of God is working this grace in us. Now, what we want to focus on is mercy. The Lord says to us here, be merciful, just as your Father is merciful. What, what does that mean? Well, Jesus already gave us many examples, but I just want to take us through a, a few different concepts to bring greater clarity to the meaning of mercy, particularly when we compare it to its two companions, justice and and grace. Now, justice is something that maybe we're familiar with, maybe we're not because of the state of our judicial system today, but if you read the Bible, at least you know what biblical justice is, what true justice is like. Justice is giving someone what they deserve. And I should say in a both positive and negative sense, right? When you work for somebody, and you agree to work for them for a certain amount and they pay you that amount for doing that work, that is just, that is justice, okay? You made an agreement, the agreement was fulfilled, we call that justice. You are getting what you deserve in a, in a positive way. If they don't pay you, well then that's unjust. Now on the other hand, if you take what belongs to someone else, justice is returning what you took, okay? That's a just penalty, okay? Uh, you took so much, you make restitution. Sometimes it's paying back the same amount, again, beyond returning what you stole so that you experience what the other person experienced when you took away what belonged to them. Justice means the penalty must be equal to the crime. It should not be a greater penalty or a less penalty but a just penalty. So justice means basically a balance and, you know, an equality between these two things. Now, again, we're talking here about God's justice. That's not the way our judicial system works today. It's the way that it should work, but it doesn't. We need to go to the Bible to see what justice truly is. So justice is giving someone what they deserve. Now, mercy means not giving somebody something which they justly deserve, at least not the penalty that justice demands for what it is that they have done to you. Now, it isn't mercy if you don't pay someone uh, what you justly owe them. That's not mercy, not giving them what they deserve. That would be stealing. But it would be mercy if you decided not to require the person who stole from you to return what they stole. You can forgive. You see, that's showing mercy. Not giving them what they deserve. Not giving them justice, 
but basically forgiving and overlooking. Now, finally, grace means giving someone something that is good that they do not deserve. Now, again, mercy is something that people don't deserve. It's given freely. But it's, it's not just mitigating a penalty, but it's actually giving them something beyond that, something good, particularly when they deserve just the opposite. That would be like giving a person who works for you the full wage that you agreed on, even though they didn't do a very good job, even though they didn't really earn or fulfill their end of the contract, that would be grace. You're giving them something good they don't deserve, okay? Or not only not requiring the thief to give back what they stole from you, but giving them something more, giving them additional resources, maybe food or money, because they've fallen into difficult times. The mercy is not requiring them to pay it back. The grace is even reaching out to take care of their needs at a higher level level. So justice is giving what is deserved. Mercy is not giving the penalty deserved. And grace is giving something good beyond, or something that isn't deserved, something beyond the mercy. Now, why do I bring those up? It's because I want us to see that all three of these things are involved in the gospel. And we need to understand that. Listen to what Paul writes in Romans 5, verses 6 through 10. He says, for while we were still helpless, at the right time Christ died for the ungodly. For one will hardly die for a righteous man, though perhaps for the good man someone would dare even to die. But God demonstrates his own love toward us in that while we were yet sinners, Christ died for us. Much more than having now been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if, while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his Son, much more having been reconciled, we shall be saved by his life. Now again, let's think about these three principles at work here. We were under God's wrath, God's just wrath for our sins. We weren't righteous, he says, not the righteous man. We weren't good. We were ungodly. We were sinners. Paul says we were God's enemies, and there was nothing we could do about it, nothing we wanted to do about it because our hearts were bent against him. We were helpless. What did God owe us justly in this situation? He owed us justice, the just penalty of our sins and of our errors, which in this case meant an eternity of suffering in hell. That is what we deserved, and if God gave it to us, he would be perfectly just to do it. But if we're trusting in Jesus, he didn't give that to us. He showed us mercy instead. He didn't give us what we deserved. Out of his infinite love, he showed us grace. Okay, he didn't give us what we deserve, hell, but he's giving to us something much better than we've ever deserved, and that is heaven. While we were sinners and enemies, he sent his son to die for us so that we might be saved from his wrath, be reconciled to him, adopted as his children, and become the heirs of his eternal kingdom. You see, we deserved hell. That was the just penalty. God doesn't give us hell. That's mercy through His Son, the Lord Jesus. He gives us heaven instead. That's grace. The Father loved us and showed us mercy and grace by sending His Son. The Father gave the payment for our sins. And Jesus loved us and showed us mercy by willingly giving His life for us. He made the payment. We are the recipients of the mercy of the Father and the Son and the Holy Spirit too. He's wrapped up in there. He is the mercy given to us so that we might trust in the Lord Jesus. Now the point is this. As those who have received mercy, we are to show mercy. We are to do for others what the Lord has done for us. We are to give. We are to forgive. And we are to do this even for our enemies. As Jesus said, 
Be like your heavenly Father. Don't just love those who love you. Don't just do good to those who do good to you. Don't just give to those that you expect to return from, but love your enemies. Show mercy to them, he says. Jesus says in Matthew 10, verse 8, freely you received, freely give. And as we've already seen, he's given us the power to do this through his Holy Spirit. Matthew 5, 7, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. And we've already gone over the fact that when Jesus is saying this, he's not saying, blessed are you if you will show mercy. But if you belong to me, you will show mercy. And if you're showing mercy, blessed are the merciful, because here are the consequences. You will also be shown mercy. Now let's talk about showing mercy the way that the Lord showed mercy. To do this, we have to understand there is a price that has to be paid. And sometimes it's a steep price. When we show mercy, it's going to cost us something. And we have to be willing to bear the loss. Again, if you show mercy to the one you hired who did a substandard job, who didn't fulfill their end of the bargain, you pay them the full wage for less than the full amount of work, you are the one suffering the loss. You see, when you show mercy, you have to bear the loss. If you show mercy to the one who stole from you and don't require them to make you know, restitution, you're agreeing to give up what it is they've taken from you. If you go even further and are gracious to them by giving even more, then the cost to you becomes even greater. Now, the same thing is true every time you show mercy, every time I show mercy, you are giving up your right to require what justice demands, the payment that justice demands, and you are the one who is then offering to pay the price to bear the loss. The Father had to be willing in order to show us mercy, to pay the price of His own dear Son, that which was most precious to Him, to show us mercy. That was the price that He had to pay. He bore the cost. The Son, the Lord Jesus Christ, had to be willing to lay down His life in order to show us mercy. He had to pay the price. He had to bear the loss. Now, remember the Good Samaritan? Did it cost him anything to show mercy to the Jew who was wounded? It cost him time. It cost him the effort. It cost him money. But it also cost him uh, something else we don't often think about, and that is he had to be willing to lay aside all the insults of the Jews. This was his enemy. These people hated him and wanted nothing to do with his race he had to be willing to forgive that and put aside that animosity and reach out and meet that need. It cost the Samaritan a good deal to do this. Now, there's a parable in Scripture where the Lord Jesus is teaching us to show mercy, to forgive. And it was an answer to Peter's question, Lord, how many times sh should my brother sin against me and I forgive him? Seven times? And Jesus says, not seven times, but 70 times seven times, which means there's no limit. And he talks about, remember, the master, and he had the servants, and one servant owed him 10,000 talents. And he came to him, the servant, and he begged, forgive me, I, I'll, I'll pay you. And the master forgave him. And then he went out and found another servant, the, the servant who was forgiven, who owed him a couple days' wages. And he says, pay me what you owe me. And he says, uh, have patience with me and I'll repay you everything. But he wouldn't. And he had him thrown into prison. And then when the master found out what he had done, he brought him back and he says, shouldn't you have shown mercy? Like I showed you mercy. And he says, take him and turn him over to the torturers until he pays back everything that is owed. When the master showed mercy to his servant who owed him the 10,000 talents, he had to be willing to bear the loss of all that money. But the person who received the mercy, who had the 10,000 talent debt removed, it bound him also to show mercy to his fellow servants. Mercy can be expensive, but I, I brought up this last example to remind us all. It is the price that we must be willing to pay. It is a price that by His grace we are willing to pay by the Holy Spirit if we belong to Him. We need to understand this. 
We have to be willing to show mercy if we are to receive mercy. If we don't understand this, then we really can't understand what Jesus said in this meditation we saw earlier in Matthew 6, verses 14 and 15. Let me read it to you again. For if you forgive others for their transgressions, your heavenly Father will also forgive you. But if you do not forgive others, remember the servant didn't have mercy on his fellow servant, then your Father will not forgive your transgressions. Remember what the master did to him when he wouldn't forgive? He brought him back and said, you now owe me 10,000 talents, and you're going to go to prison until you pay it all back. He didn't show mercy, and so he wasn't shown mercy. James writes in James 2, verse 13, for judgment will be merciless to the one who has shown no mercy. Mercy triumphs over judgment. Now, let me again just remind you that our Lord is not telling us that we need to earn His mercy. By showing mercy to others, He's telling us that if we have received His mercy, if we have been forgiven our great debts, we will show mercy to others. Remember, Jesus says, blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. If we belong to Jesus, we will love like Jesus. And mercy is one of the many fruits of his love in our hearts. Now, let me just bring up one last thing. Let's not forget that, that when we show mercy and we don't require what is justly owed, that we're not destroying justice by so doing any more than the Heavenly Father does when he shows us mercy because a payment has been made. When we show mercy to a brother or sister in the Lord Jesus Christ, we know that, that that transgression, that sin, has already been paid for by the Lord Jesus Christ. We can show mercy because the Lord has had mercy upon them. And I say that to say this, that if a brother or sister sins against you and you're unwilling to forgive them, you're seeking to require a, a second payment for something that Jesus has already paid for. You need to see that Jesus has already paid for that on the cross and that is the basis upon which you can forgive because Jesus suffered for that sin that they have committed against you. You can forgive. You can be merciful because of what the Lord has done. Now, when we, have shown, uh, when we show mercy to an unbeliever, okay, we can do that too because we know that that debt is also going to be paid in full. Either they're going to have to pay for it in hell forever if they don't repent and turn to Jesus. But if they do repent and turn to Him, Jesus will have already paid for it on the cross. So either way, all these debts are going to be settled. God's justice is going to be fully satisfied even though He is showing this mercy and this grace. He can do it because a payment has been made. He has suffered that loss. He has taken the onus upon Himself and the Son has come and made that payment. That's one way. The other way, of course, is people are going to have to pay off their own debts. If they're not willing to accept the payment that Jesus made, they're going to have to pay for it in hell. But either way, it's going to be paid for. Our Lord tells us on the basis of these things this morning, on the basis of the example of the Father, of His example, what the Spirit of God is doing in us, on, on the basis of the mercy that He has shown us through the Lord Jesus Christ, He says, Be merciful. Blessed are the merciful, for they shall receive mercy. Show the mercy that you have experienced to others. The Lord calls us to do that, and He's going to use it as a means to bring them to Himself. But it's also that which assures us that when we stand before the Lord on the day of judgment, that we will receive His mercy on that day. Because when He says, well done, good and faithful servant, we know we don't deserve that. We know that's mercy. And that is grace, but we can know that it's ours because we have a heart to show mercy. Well, let's, uh, let's bow for a moment of prayer, shall we? And, and let's ask the Lord to take what we've heard, very challenging things. Showing mercy is not an easy thing. There's a cost involved, but let's remember the mercy we've received to encourage us to show that mercy. And let's seek to be filled with the Spirit so that we'll be able... <laughs> to do that.